Vekel Gerber, a prominent Oromo politician implicated in severe atrocities and genocide against the Amhara and Orthodox Christian communities in his home region of Oromia, is actively seeking asylum in the United States. His inflammatory rhetoric has directly harmed numerous innocent civilians in Welliger. Bekele Gerber's hate speeches have played a significant role in shaping public opinion, and unfortunately, they have also had detrimental effects. They have undermined social harmony, contributed to atrocities on vulnerable ethnic Amharas, legitimized discrimination, and fueled widespread intolerance. Given the gravity of these allegations, there is an urgent need for scrutiny and careful consideration of the implications surrounding his asylum request. Despite numerous atrocities occurring in Bekele Gerber's home region of Welliga in Oromia, he consistently fails to denounce any of these acts. Troublingly, he has been observed engaging in victim-blaming, deflecting responsibility and accountability for the atrocities that have transpired. Bekele's divisive rhetoric reaches As new heights. As prominent Oromo politician, the impact of his words resonates deeply with many. He issued a directive urging Oromos to refrain from conducting any business with individuals who don't speak the Oromo language. The official language of Ethiopia is Amharic, and this directive places a significant barrier for those who aren't fluent in Oromo. This directive, seen as a soft method of ethnic cleansing, advocates for a complete cessation of transactions with non-Oromo speakers. The implicit suggestion is that those who cannot speak the language may feel compelled to leave voluntarily from Oromia. The scope of this directive extends to various aspects of daily life, from refusing to rent hotels, to denying service in restaurants and even discouraging transportation services. Making it unlivable for non Oromos in Oromo land is the purpose. During the Bekele Party Oromo Federalist Congress meeting, a shocking incident unfolded as one of the core supporters delivered a live TV speech. Shockingly, she called for a ban on Oromos, marrying individuals from Amhara communities. She even called for the dissolution of existing inter-ethnic marriages among Oromos and Amharas on live TV. What's particularly shocking was that several Oromo Federalist Congress leaders were present during this televised hate speech, and rather than condemning this hate speech, they applauded it. Notably, Bekele Gerber was observed laughing. This does not represent an isolated incident, rather it reflects the deeply ingrained politics of hatred within the Oromo political landscape. Despite 80% of the capital city Addis Ababa residents being non-Oromos, Bekele boldly asserts that Addis Ababa belongs to Oromaya, fostering a dangerous trend of ethnocentric claim. Bekele's assertive declaration of Addis Ababa as Oromo territory has had a significant impact, with the government under Abi Yai implementing discriminatory laws, reminiscent of apartheid-era South Africa. These measures include the destruction of homes, the expulsion of 800,000 Ethiopians, and the ban on Amharas from entering the city. Despite 80% of the population not being Oromo, and 95% not speaking the Oromo language, Abi appointed an Oromo mayor from the Oromia region, even though the mayor lacks any substantive connection to the city. Following the assassination of Hachalu Hundessa, Bekele Gerber's mobilization took a dark turn as he attributed the death to Amharas and Orthodox Christians. His inflammatory rhetoric further escalated the situation, ultimately leading to an ethnic cleansing campaign that resulted in the tragic deaths of hundreds of ethnic Amharas and Orthodox Christians in the Shashamen and Asi areas of Oromia. In light of these grave events, justice becomes paramount for the survivors, victims and their families. Asylum should not be granted to individuals involved in such criminal activities, and a thorough examination of Bekele Gerber's role in the violence is essential. The implications of his actions on the affected communities underscore the importance of holding individuals accountable for their involvement in incitement and violence. Hate speech prohibited by international law, is escalating in Ethiopia. 
contributing to ethnic tensions and conflicts that have displaced over three million people. As we speak right now, there is a genocide happening in Ethiopia. The cleansing of Amara people have been going on for a long time, but now things have escalated to a whole new level. Reports indicate a surge in atrocities over the last five years. Shockingly, Abiy and Oromo regional government, instead of protecting them, has been accused of being complicit. Government officials in Welliga are alleged collaborators in heinous acts, including rape, murder and robbery against innocent Amhara farmers. The situation prompts That's questions about the identity and origin of the Amhara individuals in these areas. Understanding how they ended up there and the circumstances surrounding their presence is crucial in comprehending the dynamics of the reported exploitation and violence against them. He recently conducted a bone-chilling interview in which he disparaged, insulted and further legitimised the atrocities committed against innocent Amhara civilians, particularly the minority in his home region of Welliga, Aromia. The way he expressed these sentiments was very telling. The Welliga atrocities were described as one of the most gruesome incidents in Ethiopian history. They were starved, they were bones. Welliga Oromo gave them land. Now they became big, wealthy. We made them human being. We made them human from deceased bones. Yesterday came with bone. Now they became big, wealthy. Welliga people gain nothing. Yesterday we feed them. Yesterday came with bone and become human. They came with poverty, now became prosperous. When they come to Welliga, what did they bring? Nothing. How did Amaras ended up in areas surrounded by hostile Oromo community? What prompted the Oromos in their vicinity to actively collaborate in the gruesome massacre of families, children and women. How has hate speech from the Abiy government, Oromo regional government, Oromo medias and Oromo elite contributed to the atrocities of Amaras, who were forcibly and involuntarily relocated by the ex-communist government? In the face of the most inhospitable environment, the Amaras, once settled, remarkably transformed the area through their hard work, dedication and industrious culture turning it into their home. The Ethiopian government has collectivized agriculture according to the Soviet model and have produced the same dismal results. Colonel Menginsku uh, ignored early warnings for two years that his farm policy could contribute to famine. Yet his regime now plans to extend collectivization. Since then, so refugees have been moved out of the famine-hit areas of Tigray, Wallow, and northern Shoah province down to the southwest. Total so far, 600,000. In 1980s, Ethiopia found itself in the clutches of a devastating famine, the most severe impact felt in the northern regions of the country. In response to this crisis, the communist government, under the leadership of the ethnic Oromo president Mengistu Haile Mariam, implemented a series of measures, notably resorting to the forceful relocation of Amharas and Tigrayans from their ancestral lands against their will. The controversial resettlement program, launched in late 1984, saw numerous Amharas and Tigrayans forcibly uprooted subjected to egregious human rights abuses, including violence, killing and arbitrary detention. Despite the victims' desperate desire to remain in their ancestral lands, despite the suffering, none went willingly. The international community, alarmed by the gross inhumanity of the resettlement, voiced strong opposition, leading to the suspension of the initiative. The Ethiopian government has killed an estimated 100,000 of its own people by its program of forced resettlement. 
The group, Doctors Without Borders, said the U.S. and other Western countries should stop food aid unless Ethiopia modifies the resettlement program. Programs, of coercive relocation of Ethiopians, in whatever form, a campaign of resettlement over long distances or a program of local village villagization, involuntary movement involving the disruption of families, of livelihoods, of communities, is simply unacceptable. It represents a gross violation of fundamental human rights. Toward that end, the Africa Subcommittee has in the past several years communicated its opposition directly to the Ethiopian government with respect to its forced resettlement activities and has held several hearings here in the Congress. I would note that it would appear, and given the uh, suspension of the resettlement program, that the entreaties by members of Congress and by other members of the international community appear to have had some impact uh, on government response. It's crucial to note that the mass relocation extended beyond areas directly affected by the severe famine, as the government aimed to depopulate area due to the civil war. The enforced relocation caused significant emotional distress, cultural shock, fragmentation of communities and the breakdown of community support structures. Settlers encountered a challenging environment characterized by the absence of infrastructure, a high prevalence of malaria, and a lack of essential services such as education and health care. Many attempted to escape to their ancestral lands in Amara, but the government responded harshly, with some paying the ultimate price, losing their lives in the process. Now we go to forced resettlement and villagization. Villagization is one of the newer, and that is a policy where people are forced to destroy the homes where they're living, move to another place, build a hut, there are no arrangements for them. They are in an agricultural situation which is unfamiliar, subject to uh, diseases such as malaria, which they haven't known. And the purpose is generally admitted to be political, to get the people together, collected, where you can influence them and control them. Take them away from their scattered little farms and villages and force them. Brian Stewart of the CBC. Resettlement began at the height of the famine panic last December. CBC News pictures of the first pathetic refugees being crammed into the bellies of Soviet planes were the only ones taken of a movement shrouded in mystery. Many Western governments and aid agencies remain highly skeptical of such a movement. Getting in to check on the new settlers is not easy. They had to drive for hours through near trackless jungle in Ellen. New hamlets do seem rudimentary and hastily planned. Families have been separated, and many northerners do have trouble coping with the steaming humidity. There's also much malaria, which nearly killed this child, and few medical resources. In the midst of challenging circumstances, the Amhara settlers rose to the occasion showcasing their industrious spirit and earning recognition for their exceptional hard work, unwavering dedication and strong family-oriented values. These individuals emerged as transformative agents within their communities, directing their efforts toward initiatives that aimed to improve various aspects of life. Their initiatives spanned diverse spheres, encompassing a proactive approach to enhancing agricultural productivity, active involvement in land development projects and the strategic diversification of economic activities. Through the establishment of small businesses and engagement in trading, the Amhara settlers not only demonstrated resilience in the face of adversity, but also displayed a keen ability to adapt to challenging circumstances. The impact of their collective endeavors extended far beyond individual success stories. A ripple effect was evident in the formation of robust communities, interconnected support networks and collaborative ventures. These initiatives played a pivotal role in facilitating social and cultural adaptation, fostering a profound sense of unity and shared purpose among the Amhara settlers. Since a bee came to power in 2018, unrelenting massacres have resulted in thousands of deaths with 1.4 million Amharas being internally displaced and forced to live in harsh conditions. These displaced individuals have nowhere else to turn, experiencing profound trauma from the violence. They face an uncertain future, lacking guarantees if they attempt to return 
having lost family members and carrying scars that will last a lifetime. Village full of dead bodies. That's how one area in western Ethiopia was described. More than 200 people have reportedly been killed in Ethiopia in an attack in the Aromia. One of the deadliest mass killings in the East African nation. Most of the dead are of the Amhamra people. The country. On Sunday, more than 200 people were killed in Aromia. They were mostly from the Amhara. Hate speech serves as a precursor to egregious acts such as mass killings, massacres, marginalization and genocide. Bekele exacerbated this by not attempting to quell it. Instead, he amplified it through his influential position in Oromo politics. Rather than mitigating tensions, he furthered them, making it increasingly challenging for individuals of other ethnicities, particularly the Amharas, to coexist in Oromia. His inflammatory hate speeches has contributed to the continuous harassment, threats, intimidation, humiliation, oppression, and even massacres faced by the Amharas. Meanwhile, Bekele leads a comfortable life in America, benefiting from the generous welfare system provided by the United States. Certain individuals seek refuge as refugees to evade accountability for crimes committed in their home countries, citing Bekele Gerber as an example. To Amhara lawyers in America and Canada, it is urged that they unite and legally pursue Bekele Gerber for his alleged involvement in the Amhara genocide. It's essential to note that one of the criteria for asylum in the US is a clean record regarding crimes committed in the home country.